Good evening. This is Norman Vincent Peale. Let's talk about you. CBS Radio brings you Norman Vincent Peale with his guest tonight, General James Doolittle. Each evening at this time, Monday through Friday, Norman Vincent Peale talks about you. Now to introduce his guest, the distinguished author, editor, lecturer, and guide to fuller living, Dr. Peale. General Jimmy Doolittle is one of the great pilots of all time. He is an engineer, a doctor of science, and he holds the Congressional Medal of Honor. When he was made a lieutenant general in 1944, he was the youngest three-star general in the Army. There have been many crises in General Doolittle's life, and many things in his experience to look back upon. But tonight, in looking back, Jimmy Doolittle recalls an incident in his early boyhood. My religious faith has always meant something very personal to me, so much so that until recently I've hesitated to talk about it, lest I sound sanctimonious or like a holy Joe. Yet the world needs people to take a stand on their religious beliefs. Silence on the part of those who believe in God can actually aid the cause of atheism. Today, one must be for something rather than just against an evil. I am for the building of a peaceful world based on the concept of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Since my travels take me to so many places throughout the world, I never think of my faith in relation to any one church. I have always felt that acceptance of God as the controlling power and the advancement of religious understanding among all faiths are far more important than the promotion of any one faith or religious group. My experience along this line began in my early youth, when Mother and I went to Alaska to join my father, who, although a carpenter by trade, was there to prospect for gold. In Nome, there were three churches located in our neighborhood, Methodist, Congregationalist, and Catholic. I recall vividly my first Christmas. The Methodists had a Christmas tree for the kids and the Congregationalists gave away prizes, and the Catholics served ice cream. I went to all. My buoyant youthful reaction to all of this was more temporal than spiritual, but the idea did sink in that there is much good in every faith and denomination. I haven't found anything since to make me feel differently. Well, that's a great idea, Jimmy Doolittle gives us, isn't it? About making the rounds of the churches and eating ice cream in one and a cold drink in another, and so on. But that's America. We're all believers in God. And really, it doesn't make any difference how you arrive at God, as long as you do arrive. And Jimmy Doolittle certainly arrived. He will go down in history as one of our great military men who helped to save this great country in one of the hours of its great crisis. He uh, has said that uh, he believes in being for something rather than being against something. And again, he has hit upon a very wise point of view. I like his emphasis upon the fact that he is for a peaceful world. That, of course, is the great problem of our time. How to get a peaceful world. Our political leaders are working for it. We're all thinking about it, discussing it, and I think trying to help them. But I'd like to uh, go out at this question at a, in a different way tonight and to say that I believe one way in which we can contribute to a peaceful world, such as General Doolittle says he wants to attain, is for the individual himself to learn how to be peaceful. If you have peaceful people and peaceful homes, won't we at last have a peaceful nation? And if this can be, as I'm sure it can, transmitted to the whole world, won't we have a peaceful world? I had the uh, audacity not long ago to speak to about 1,000 women at one time. I was the only man in the room. I felt like a certain gentleman uh, who spoke to... The girls at Wellesley College years, years ago, he was nervous, and they asked him how he felt about it. He said he would rather speak to one girl a thousand times than to a thousand girls one time. <laughs> they asked me to tell these women what were the primary functions of a wife, and I did. 
And I went right off the stage out the back door. <laughs> but I told them this, and I still hold to it, that I think the function of a wife is to make a calm and serene home for her husband and for her children, and incidentally, for herself. A man has a right to come home at night to a place of peace. And certainly a little child has the right to be reared in an atmosphere of quietness and of serenity. I know a little child one time who developed a pain in the stomach that nobody could, uh, could heal. The doctors, uh, all fine doctors, finally they decided that the child had a psychic pain. And the reason for it was that the home was a bedlam. It was a turmoil. The little child couldn't explain it. But when they brought that thing that we call the peace of God into the home, the little child got well. The stomach pain went away and hasn't come back to this day. Now, it may be a far stretch to say that society has a, has a pain at the very center of its being. And perhaps it's because we do not possess what our forefathers did, namely serenity and quietness. They lived with the hills and the great trees and the singing river and the great surging ocean. And they worked with the serenities of nature. And they had peacefulness. So, if the individual will learn how to be peaceful, I believe perhaps society of which the individual is a part will learn to be peaceful. And I, I think we all must agree that our people today aren't very serene for example, some time ago, I spoke to a national drug manufacturing association. About three years ago, it was. And they told me at that time that it required seven million sleeping tablets every night to put the American people to sleep. This astonished me, and I, was, I thought it was incredible. But about a year and a half later, I spoke to another drug manufacturing concern, and they were as worried about this as anybody. They told me it had then risen to um, 13 million sleeping tablets every night. And about a year ago, I spoke to still another drug association. I think I've pretty well covered the drug field now. And uh, was told by one of the leading druggists of the United States that it now requires 20 million sleeping tablets every night to get the American people into the arms of Morpheus. Now, this is a strange, sad situation. You would think if a man couldn't do anything else, he would at least know how to sleep. But uh, as a minister, I can testify to you that... Uh, uh, the American people are so nervous, so tense, so wrought up that uh, it has been years that you could, since I've seen anybody sleep in church, you can't even, you cannot even put them to sleep with a sermon anymore. And that is a sad situation. Then I was told by some uh, man not long ago who claimed to know that this year there will be in the United States a total of seven and one-half billion headaches. Now, I got a paper and pencil and figured that out, and that figures out at about 50 headaches per head per annum. <laughs> Have you had your quota yet? <laughs> but isn't it a sad thing to, to realize that uh, this uh, wonderful, wonderful American people of ours are, are so wrought up, so nervous, so tense, so lacking in peace. How do you how do you find peace? Then? What are some simple steps by which you can attain it? Well, I think you have to do just some very simple things. For example, a friend of mine was a a great American artist, Howard Chandler Christie. He was one of the most serene men I ever knew in my life. He painted my picture, for example, when he was nearly eighty. This portrait of mine was one of his hardest because he had nothing much to work on. But uh, I got a great many ideas from him. I never saw anything in him but serenity and certainly no anxiety. And I said to him one day, I said, Howard, don't you ever worry? Why, he said, no, of course not. I said, why not? Well, he said, I don't believe in it. There's no sense in it. I said, didn't you ever worry? Well, he said, once I did, just once in my life I worried some years ago said, I noticed that everybody was worrying, and I thought they were getting so much out of it that, uh, that I was missing something. I decided that, uh, that I'd better worry. 
So he said I set aside a certain day as my worry day. I went to bed uh, early the night before because if you're going to worry, you want to get a good night's sleep. He said the next morning I eat myself a good big breakfast because nobody wants to worry on an empty stomach. And then I sat down about 10 o'clock and started worrying, and I worried my head off. I did the best worrying I could do until about 12 o'clock, noon, and I couldn't make head or tail of it, and I gave it up as a bad job and just quit. Well, he was a great man, and that sounds rather foolish, and I knew he had a, he had something more substantial than that. I asked him how, how he was able to overcome worry and uh, all of the frustrations of life. Why, he says, every night when I go to bed, he said, I lie down in my bed, and I open up my mind, and I ask the good Lord to just fill my mind with peace and quietness. And he said, I just lie there and let all of the anxiety thoughts flow out of my mind. And I believe that the good Lord is filling my mind with peace. And he said, I, I go to sleep, and I sleep like a baby. All night long. And he said, when the next morning comes, I get up and I thank the good Lord for the wonderful day he has given me and just to fill me with some more peace and quietness. And he says, I'm 80 years old now and I've had the blessing of serenity all my life. So perhaps to have a peaceful world, we should practice being peaceful people. Thank you very much, Dr. Peel. Now, Dr. Peel, would you tell us about your guest for tomorrow night? Tomorrow night, we're going to meet a man whose whole life and career seemed to end in the flash of a single instant. A man who learned that to overcome the tragic effects of that instant required the calm courage and faith of years. May I invite our friends to join us tomorrow night when my guest will be Ben Hogan. Norman Vincent Peel, distinguished author, editor, lecturer, and guide to fuller living, is heard each weekday evening over CBS Radio as he talks about you. Dr. Peel's guest tomorrow night will be the great American golfer, Ben Hogan. Thursday night, the Honorable Claire Booth Luce, ambassador to Italy. Friday night, the Metropolitan Opera star, Mimi Benzel. If you would like copies of tonight's talk by Dr. Peel, simply address a postcard or letter to Norman Vincent Peel, Box 100, New York. Or if you plan to be in New York in the near future and would like to visit one of these broadcasts, write to Tickets, CBS Radio, 485 Madison Avenue, New York. This is the CBS Radio Network.